and dear chairman, I'm happy to talk as an electrophysiologist about biomarkers to you. It was my former hobby. So I have to talk about new and old cardiac biomarkers. A biomarker is a traceable substance that is introduced into an organism as a means to examine organ function or other aspects of health. A research of awards presented between 1986 to 2009 revealed a total of about 30,000 NIH grants concerning the term biomarker. The total fund for these awards in 2008 to 2009 alone were over $2.5 billion. And a PubMed search for the term between 1990 to 2009 revealed nearly half a million published articles within 40,000 published in 2008, and I will talk about all of them now. The PubMed search for cardiac biomarkers, you see in the last decades, the amount of publications made on biomarkers. And you all know that in parallel, uh, we have an increase of coronary interventions and coronary PCIs with a huge difference in European countries. And is there a relation to the increasing use of biomarkers, especially troponin in chest pain patients? I don't want to answer this question. Everybody can answer it for himself. And therefore, I changed my talk to new and old cardiac biomarkers in acute coronary syndromes. On this slide, you see the development of the different biomarkers in the last decades. On the left-hand side, the old AST, and on the right-hand side, the high-sensitive troponins. And in between, you see the definitions of the myocardial infarction. If you talk about biomarkers in the acute coronary syndrome, we have a lot of biomarkers. You can go for myocardial damage, such as the troponins. You can go for myocardial ischemia, for left ventricular dysfunction, such as the BNP, for inflammation metabolism, or other organ dysfunction, such as the, rain, uh, the renal dysfunction and the cystatin C. The ideal biomarker exists in a high concentration in myocardium. It does not exist in any other tissue, neither under normal nor under pathological conditions. It's not measurable in plasma under normal conditions. It's released only after irreversible damage of myocardium is released in direct proportion to extent of myocardial necrosis, is rapidly released and persists in plasma long enough to allow a convenient diagnostic time window, and is suitable for development of rapid, reliable, and inexpensive methods for measurement. When we talk about biomarkers in the acute coronary syndromes, we have to talk about the definition of the myocardial infarction. And it's defined as the rise and fall of cardiac biomarkers, preferable the troponins, with at least one value above the 99th percentile upper reference, and with clinical symptoms of ischemia, with ST segment elevation changes or left bundle branch block, or with regional wall abnormalities in echo, or, last but not least, identification of an intracoronary thrombus by angiography or autopsy. And the biomarkers are released from structural proteins from the myocardial, including the normal turnover of myocardial cells. It's released through apoptosis and myocyte necrosis, through to increased cellular wall permeability, and maybe through to membranous blaps. I have to talk some words on the necrosis biomarkers of the past. You all know the LDA and the AST. The LDA exists in myocytes, in the skeletal, muscle, liver, and a lot of other uh, organs. We have five major isoenzymes, whereas the LDA1 and 2 are very important for us as cardiologists. And it starts to rise above 10 to 12 hours after infarction and normalizes after one week. It's the same for the old-fashioned IST. Here you see the necrosis biomarkers of the present. We have the myoglobin, the CKMB, the, C the troponin E, and the troponin T. And as you see on these slides, they start to rise about four to eight hours after myocardial infarction. 
the old creatinine kinase. You all know it's an enzyme for regeneration of ATP from ADP. It's the most activities in the skeletal muscle, uh, followed by the heart and by the brain. And we have three isoenzymes, whereas the CKMB is uh, very important for us. And if it's above 6% of the total CK activity, we have a myocardial injury. The CKMB has an excellent specificity of about 97 to 99% with a relatively low specificity. But with repeated testing at three hours, you can increase the sensitivity up to 88% with a sensitivity maximi uh, maximized at a nine-hour period. The CK and CKMB have a relative good correlation between infarct size and level of the CK. Here you see very old studies from the 80s which have shown these in animal models and in necropsy data. To the myoglobin, it's a low molecular weight protein. It's not cardiac specific, you know it, but it's released more rapidly than ZKMB and troponin after two hours. The value of serial determination is limited, limited by its brief duration of elevation. Here you see the amount of uh, myoglobin far before ZKMB and the troponin levels. Let's talk about the troponins. The troponins exist in three protein complexes, the troponin C, the troponin T, and the troponin E. Troponin T is produced by only one manufacturer and is therefore standardized. Troponin E by many factors and is not standardized. The T is hydrophilic, the E is lipophilic. You have some free cytosolic amount of both troponins from about 2.5 to 8%. And only troponin T is freely released into the blood, troponin E and the most part from troponin T in form of complexes. What are you doing with this patient? 65-year-old patient with chest pain, current smoker, diabetes, hypertension and ST segment elevation. Do you need cardiac biomarker? Certainly not. You send him to the cath lab. But what do you, do you do with this patient, a 62-year-old 62, 62 female patient presenting with sepsis due to pyelonephritis? She has some EGC changes in the emergency ward, and somebody is assessing the troponin and the CK. And you all know we went with this patient to the cath lab not only once, and some of these patients have normal coronary arteries. And in the meantime, we know that a big variety of diseases besides the acute coronary syndromes can elevate the troponins. So the industry gave us the high-sensitive troponins. What is different? In the high-sensitive troponin, you have the 99th percentile. Everything above this percentile is pathologic. Everything below is normal. In the troponin T, we don't really know where the 99 percentile is, and the cutoff levels are sometimes much more higher, so we have a gray zone, and uh, in this gray zone, we need a second assessment for ruling out acute coronary syndrome sometimes. And therefore, because we went with a lot of people to the with the, assess with the introduction of the high sensitive troponins, we went with a lot of people to the coronary labs, and Therefore, we call it troponinitis when the coronary were normal, and the word in English is troponinemia and troponinosis. And we know from a U.S. chest pain population that the troponin T is positive in about 15% of patients, and only 2% of them had myocardial infarction. And there are a lot of different studies which investigated the same in the high-sensitive troponins in patients without myocardial infarctions, but the high risk of coronary artery disease. And we have a lot of people with slightly elevated high-sensitive troponins beside the acute coronary syndromes. And the, di the prognosis in these patients is mostly worse. And therefore, I find this nomogram from Lemos very important. If you have troponins above the 99th percentile, you have to go for uh, the history of the patient for assessment of the EGC or echocardiography. And if you go for the coronary lab and you find an occlusion of the coronary vessel, you can talk from a type 1 myocardial infarction. 
If the vessels are open you, and uh, you have necrosis, you have myocyte necrosis, but not the uh, so-called occluded myocardial infarction, it's a type 2 myocardial infarction. And on the other hand, if the high sensitive troponins or the troponins are chronically elevated, maybe you have to look for a possible underlying diseases or underlying structural heart diseases, and maybe you can assess the risk factors of the patients and to treat them. But the data, how to handle this patient and to improve the prognosis in these patients are sparse. So if you have somebody in the emergency department with chest pain, with the old troponins, you had to wait for about seven, out, seven hours to rule out the acute coronary syndromes. With the high sensitive troponins, it, begot, it got a little bit better, and I think we need now about four hours to rule out the acute coronary syndrome. And uh, Reichlin uh, did a good investigation in about uh, for, for more than 400 patients where he assessed the troponin T at baseline and one hour after presentation in the emergency department. And he made a nomogram, and I think this is very important that you can rule out patients if the baseline high sensitive troponin is below 12 nanograms per liter and the absolute changes within one hour are below three, you have a 100% sensitivity with a 100% uh, uh, negative predictive value to send the patient home for further investigation of his chest pain. On the other hand, if you have a high sensitive troponin above 52 nanograms per liter with an absolute change after one hour of, uh, of five nanograms, you have a high specificity and a high p positive predictive value to rule in acute coronary syndrome. What about the prognosis of the troponins? The Müller group from Basel did some investigations in the high sensitive troponins and they found that the high sensitive cardiac troponin is very good to, for prognosis of patients. And he has nicely shown that the higher the troponins were, the higher were the two years mortality of these patients. Do high sensitive troponin changes during follow-up predict outcome? I data are sparse. We know from the Framingham offspring study uh, that high sensitive troponins were detectable in 81% of patients and that the higher levels showed higher mortality and higher, uh, uh, higher heart failure development but not myocardial infarction. And in the cardiovascular health study in uh, patients above 65 years, uh, there, a lot of patients, two-thirds, had slightly elevated high-sensitive troponins, and they did a second assessment of the troponins two to three years later, and they have nicely shown that if the troponins rose, the prognosis of these patients uh, was worse too. If the troponins got better, the prognosis became better. So we have some data that influencing of the troponins might say something about the prognosis. This patient, a 60-year-old patient with chest pain, negative troponin, normal echocardiography in the emergency department. You can wait for four hours with the high sensitive, with the normal for about eight hours. You can use the Reichlin method, or you can combine different uh, biomarkers. Only one study, the Romicat study, uh, which has nicely shown that if you combine troponins with uh, BMP or ANP, you have a relatively high negative predictive value and uh, the blood samples were assessed about four to two hours after presentation at the emergency ward. You can do the same with copeptin, another biomarker which is commercially available. The new biomarkers in the acute coronary syndromes, the data are not complete. For all of them you have kits, you can buy them. Uh, we have to decide what we want to know. If you want to go for diagnosis, the troponins are the best, followed by the uh, heart fatty acid binding protein, BMP, or maybe the copeptin. But all of these biomarkers give some, some data about bad prognosis if they are slightly elevated. But for selection of the therapy, the data are very sparse. What are the biomarkers for the future? 
maybe the micro RNA is a very uh, is a good candidate. Uh, how I come back? The micro RNA is uh, is a good candidate. This study from Wang has shown that the micro RNA eight to two hundred and eight is cardioselective in comparison to the 1 in 133 or 49, uh, 499, and it's detectable within one to four hours after myocardial infarction. It was nicely shown in an animal model and in a human model that you can use this microRNAs for diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. So last but not least, we should have a biomarker to assess the winner of the World Soccer Cup 214. And if you want to know that, you have to use the Delphi method. And I called uh, uh, the oracle from Delphi. And you can't imagine what she said to me. Uh, the winner will be Switzerland. She told me with a relatively high specificity, but she doesn't know the sensitivity until now. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, at the moment, the preferable biomarker in the acute coronary syndrome are the troponins, especially the high-sensitive troponins. If you use them, you should be a good clinician with some skills in echocardiography. And the elevation of cardiac biomarkers outside the acute coronary syndrome mostly predict adverse clinical outcome. However, randomized controlled trials how to treat this specific group of patients are sparse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Amman, for this uh, very balanced uh, overview. Are there any questions? No questions? Um, what, uh, what is your, um, uh, your guess? Um, uh, I think we need some correction marker for the uh, high sensitivity uh, troponin. Of course, correction might be done by uh, clinical judgment, might be or should be done by uh, inclusion of uh, ECG and uh, echo characteristics, but uh, um, we would like to have something uh, in addition. So we were working uh, at, uh, on markers of uh, phagocyte activation. We could not prove a, um, a, a true uh, value, additional value of those markers. Uh, what, uh, what marker um, of the uh, current uh, Currently uh, available markers uh, would you suggest uh, to be uh, um, investigated uh, uh, in the future? It's a very difficult question. I don't know what marker we should develop because we have a very good one in the high sensitive troponins. I think it's a very sensitive test and you, you, you should know how to handle it. Uh, we in the Canton Spital in St. Gallen, we don't have the high sensitive troponin until now, but all hospitals around, them, around us have the high sensitive troponins. I think uh, for the, you, you should know what you want to do with this test. If you want to go for, an, for the diagnosis of the acute coronary syndromes, the high sensitive troponin is great, but you need some skills on, yeah. on uh, clinical skills, and you, you need a 24 hour echocardiography ward, I think so, to, uh, to decide what to do with this high sensitive troponin sometimes. And if you don't do that and you send all patients to us, uh, yes, you have a sensitive test with. Uh, some uh, uh, fails negative uh, yeah. results. You could increase uh, cutoff levels, yes, but then you lose some sensitivity. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I would say that the future is not maybe to have one uh, biomarker, but it's combined biomarkers like copetin and HS troponin. You can combine and have the, the advantage of each biomarker <clears throat> in order to be uh, more sensitive and more specific. So I would say that you don't have to bet for one biomarker, but you have to bet for several biomarkers. This is a comment. I don't want if you want to it, comment on that. Yeah, I, I think 
it's always a question, what do you want to have? I think if you're in, in the emergency ward and you want to put rule out the acute coronary syndrome, you can do that, yes. Maybe the Reichle method with the high-sensitive troponin is good enough if it's repeated in other studies. And, if, uh, and till now, I combine the troponins with the BMPS sometimes, and if they both are negative, I have a relatively high negative predictive value for the acute coronary syndromes. And the copeptine is good too, yes. There are some studies. Bernie. Yeah, I, I sent some uh, feel of guilt if you send somebody to a coronary angiogram that turns out normal uh, because of uh, false positive uh, biomarkers. Don't feel guilty. I mean, <laughs> sending somebody to coronary angiography, you, can you cannot possibly lose. If it's uh, positive, you find something, of course you did the right thing, a patient needs treatment. If you find normal coronary arteries, that's a good thing too, because uh, of course if the patient has a complication during coronary angiography, you may regret it, but that practically never occurs. It's a very safe procedure. And normal coronary arteries at an age of 50 or older practically guarantees that this patient will never have an atherosclerotic problem, no stroke, no myocardial infarction for the rest of, of, of their lives. And that's something very important to know. So uh, there is no such thing as an unnecessary coronary angiogram. <laughs> yeah, but it might okay. be... <laughs> But it might be that you have an elevated troponin, you know you have a bad prognosis, but you can't do anything because the coronary arteries are normal. And maybe you have a lot of costs afterwards for other diagnostics. Well, I think with this um, uh, important remark from Bernie, we, uh, we uh, go ahead to